Blog Talk Radio. Welcome, world. Welcome once again to Tuesday Talk with Key West Lou. I am your host, Louis Patron. Well, this was a hell of a week. That's the only way I can describe it. Uh, a lot of things happened politically, internationally, sports-wise. So I'm going to open the show tonight with Syracuse University and their basketball team. I have mentioned Syracuse many times on the show. I've written about it in the blog that I put out daily many times. I am a Syracuse graduate. I love Syracuse University. I love our basketball team. I bleed orange. Absolutely no question about it. We have not had a good basketball team this year. Since 1980, this is probably the third year we have had a poor basketball team. A number of reasons entered in, enter into it. Not important what they are at the moment. The big tournament every year is the NCAA. Uh, that's the one that takes you to the Final Four. And Syracuse, I did not think, was going to make it. We only won 19 games. Very few teams make uh, the tournament who haven't won 20 plus games. Plus, we lost some very important games. I think towards the close of the season, we, we, we lost six significant games. Uh, and I thought we were not going to make it. We were on the bubble, but again, I thought we'd end up as second class citizens in the NIT. Well, for whatever reason, we got there and we were a 10th seed in our section. Syracuse, the, the, Sweet 16 was this past weekend, and then Sunday, of course, was the Elite Eight. Syracuse was in the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight. They've won four games against powerful opponents. This past weekend in the Elite Eight, Syracuse played Virginia. Throughout this past basketball season, Virginia has generally been number one in the country, and they are also ranked as a number one seed in the tournament. We beat Syracuse. We beat Virginia, sixty-eight to sixty-two. Now, six points may not sound like a wow, but it is a wow because with eight minutes to go, Syracuse was losing by sixteen points. You heard me, sixteen points with eight minutes to go, and they end up winning sixty-eight sixty-two. Let me say something to you. I'm happy for the school. I'm thrilled. The team deserves it, and the coach deserves it. Bayheim had a hard time with the NCAA this past year. He was suspended for nine games, lost something like 109 games from his victories, uh, a beating he should not have taken. Many of you will disagree with me on this, but it's a beating he should not have taken. I admire and respect Jim Bayheim. I know him personally. He's a man of quality. So I'm glad for him they got this far, and they're going to the final. They're in the final four this weekend. And you wonder why. How did it come about? They had such a rotten season, and all of a sudden they're, they're moving uh, uh, when the season's over in the big tournament. Uh, Gabinji, our, our, probably our best player, senior, his name, name difficult to pronounce, G-B-I-N-I-J-E, Gabinji, uh, was interviewed after the Gonzaga game, and he was asked by the reporter, why is this happening? And you know what he said? And I quote, they told us we didn't belong. They told us we didn't belong in this tournament. And with that, he smiled and walked away. And that's probably what did it. These guys are not giving up. They have won the last two games. They won were fantastic Gonzaga and Virginia victories. I hope they do well this weekend. But if they lose right away this weekend, if they lose in the final game this weekend, it doesn't matter. They got so far in this tournament, a tournament everyone agreed they should not be in, including me. They have overachieved, and already their year is made. But I hope we win the Final Four, my friends. Okay, let's go in now to something dramatic that's happened in California. This past week, it was announced between the lawmakers and the unions and Governor Brown that California was going to go to a minimum wage of $15 an hour. They are the first state in the country to do this. It won't be by legislation. It's by agreement with the lawmakers and the unions and the state government. I don't know how it works out, the details. But it's going to start at $10.50 next year and then gradually move up to $15 an hour. It puts California at the forefront, as I said, of the $15 an hour minimum wage battle. The governor and the legislature and the unions are all to be complimented. Uh, this was only announced yesterday, by the way. Uh, they've done a great thing here. 
and you know, by the time they reach fifteen dollars an hour, though it's going to be in several years, probably won't be enough. We've got to start taking care of our people. We can't remain a one percent, ninety nine percent nation. Fifteen dollars an hour isn't going to change things, but going to make it a hell of a lot better for a lot of people to subsist. I want to talk about politics a bit here. Why not? It's all over the news. I try to stay away from it in the show because we're pounded with it every day. And even I, who am a political junkie, I am sick of these primary campaigns this year. But I want to show you what's going on in this country at different times regarding politics. We think that this year is the worst. We think this Trump thing and Hillary and Sanders, these are all terrible things that are going on. People are at each other's throats, in effect. They're rabble-rousing. Trump's rabble rousing his followers, says there's going to be violence, and he has encouraged violence. There has been some. Well, let me tell you, this has been going on since the birth of this country. 1834, 1834, uh, Andrew Jackson was president of the United States. Very proud man, Andrew Jackson. Uh, He got censured, censured by the United States Senate. Uh, The Senate wanted him as president to produce certain documents. He said no. And he would not produce them, and they couldn't force him to produce them. But nevertheless, they censured him for not cooperating. It was the opposing party that censured him. The opposing party was led by another great American who never made the presidency, Henry Clay. He led the censure movement. Uh, And uh, you have to understand that in 1832, two years before the censure vote, Henry Clay ran for president of the United States against Andrew Jackson, and Andrew Jackson beat him, okay? So there's bad blood between these two guys, especially coming from Clay at that time against Jackson. So here we come. They're political enemies. Jackson took the censure. He was a proud man as a very personally. He felt it was a reprimand of a personal nature and should not have been. It meant nothing as a matter of law. It had no legal significance, but he was insulted. Uh, Jackson retired from the presidency several years later. His leaving comments, one of his final words were to the, to the effect, my only regret, my only regret was that I was not able to shoot Henry Clay. Beautiful, isn't it? I was not able to shoot Henry Clay. Now, this past week, my column that publishes tomorrow in Conk Life is called Mama, Where's My Pa? Mama, Where's My Pa? And this has to do with the presidential election and the sex scandal. Uh, The rhyme that I'm going to be attesting to here is Mama, Where's My Pa? In the White House. Ha, ha, ha. Grover Cleveland, 1884, was running for president of the United States the first time. His opponent was James Blaine. Grover Cleveland had a distinguished career. He was sheriff of Erie County, mayor of Buffalo, and governor of New York. James Blaine has a distinguished career. He was in the United States House of Representatives. He was speaker of the House of Representatives. He was a United States senator and served as secretary of state three different times under two different presidents. Cleveland won a close election. During the election campaign, though, it was revealed that Grover Cleveland had had an illegitimate child 10 years before. An illegitimate child 10 years before. That would sort of screw things up today, and I think it did screw things up back then. Cleveland's associates, political aides, political cronies were all nervous. What are we going to do? They're saying you're the father, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And Grover Cleveland told them, this is one story. There's two stories to everything in this world. Uh, Tell the truth. Whatever you do, tell the truth. And he admitted. He says, you know, I knew her. I had sex with her several times ten years ago. Uh, Everyone else had sex with her, too, though. She was uh, a woman that was sexually active. Uh, Nice lady, but sexually active. And uh, a lot of my friends had sex with her. I, I admitted that I was the father, and the only reason I took responsibility 10 years ago, legally, no one knew about it, uh, was because all my friends were married, and I was single, so I'm helping them. I'm saving their asses, in effect. I'm the bachelor in the group. I'll take the hit. He supported the child. It was a boy for one year. Then he stopped supporting the child because he was of the opinion this kid was not his blood, of his blood. Well... 
he went out. The people didn't buy the story. Cleveland went out to win and has been known as Gro- he always was known as Grover the Good and Mr. Clean. And typical of that was whatever you do, tell the truth that he advised his political cronies. It was thought up till 2011 that Cleveland was Grover the Good and Mr. Clean. Then Charles Lackman in 2011 published a book called A Secret Life, The Lies and Scandals of President Grover Cleveland. Now understand first that Lackman is not a two-bit writer. Uh, He's a writer of renown. He's respected in in the industry, in the writing industry. Uh, He had a previous book that received quite a bit of accolades and was a bestseller on the Lincolns. Uh, the book he wrote in 2011 about Grover Cleveland, that was his secret, The Secret Life of Grover Cleveland, sold over one million copies. And what he says is the story ain't what has been thought all these years. And he put three years into researching this book, by the way. The true story is uh, that it was a date rape situation. The woman did not want to have sex with Grover Cleveland. Uh, he insisted, and there was violence. He assaulted her, and it would constitute date, date rape today, he says. Uh, the woman was Maria Helton, by the way. Uh, he said that none of the friends had sex with this woman. Interestingly, the on the birth certificate, Maria Helton put um, the law partner, his law partner, his name escapes me for a moment here, uh, Oswald or Oscar, Oscar Folsom, Oscar Folsom's name on the birth certificate is the father. Uh, Oscar was the law partner at the time of Grover Cleveland. And uh, that was arranged. Not that it wasn't her idea. She didn't know that his name went on it. She thought Grover Cleveland's name was on the birth certificate. While this thing is brewing, the baby's born, the baby's a few days old, it is claimed in Lachman's book that the Cleveland people kidnapped the baby from the hospital, I repeat, kidnapped the baby from the hospital, and put it into an institution uh, for orphan children. Uh, and that when Maria Helping got out of the hospital after having given birth, she was immediately placed in a lunatic asylum. This was common in those days. Everybody went into lunatic asylums if something was wrong, and they put her in a lunatic asylum. Uh, the baby uh, was a boy. He ultimately was adopted, soon was adopted, by a well-known Western New York family, raised well. He ended up becoming a physician, a very well-known New York gynecologist, New York City gynecologist. His name was James King, Jr., Dr. James King, Jr. Uh, Martha did not stay in the lunatic asylum very long. Uh, because the director of the asylum interviewed her, talked with her, and came to the conclusion in writing, this woman isn't crazy, she does not belong here, and he said, she is here as the result of political wrongdoing. Okay, so that's the story. Uh, Maria went on to get married to somebody, had several children, died poor, has nothing to do with the price of eggs, just sharing here. Uh, What I'm suggesting is that Charles Lackman's story is correct, and the one that was years ago, it was a falsehood. And here, this is what Grover the Good, Mr. Clean, did to make sure he didn't lose the, his, uh, the campaign he was waging to become president of the United States. My column hits the stand, new stands tomorrow. Read it. You will enjoy the entire story. Uh, staying with politics for one more moment. Bear with me, please, my friends. I'm going to talk about political activities, and I'm going to talk about Donald Trump. I do not support Donald Trump. I think he's a bully. I think he's crazy. I think he will be the ruination of the United States. I am one of those people that have compared him to Adolf Hitler in the early and mid-1930s in Germany. So let's talk about some of the gutter politics that are going on here, which I attribute to Donald Trump. Trump, the past couple of weeks, he and Cruz, Senator Cruz, are in this battle. Trump says, I'm going to reveal something about Cruz's wife, unless Cruz backs off on what he said about my wife. Well, as you know, Cruz said nothing about his wife. Her pictures, this is a beautiful woman. This Melania, his third wife, is a beautiful woman. She's a model. She was laying almost completely nude, uh, a professional shot in a famous magazine, and apparently uh, a pack group that Cruz knew nothing about. They were going to 
had this ad, put an ad on TV saying this is bad stuff, etc. And Trump says, I'm going to go after your wife now. And this type of garbage has no place in any type of activity, especially uh, public elections. Now, today, today, just today, uh, Trump's campaign manager, Mr. Lewandrowski, was arrested. He was charged with a criminal misdemeanor of simple assault. This goes back three weeks ago to the female reporter who, who claimed, and it's on video, that she was grabbed, that she was trying to interview uh, Trump, and her arm was twisted, and she almost fell to the ground. And there is a pretty, pretty good-sized uh, uh, bad, bad mark on her arm. Uh, she, has, she has a bruise, big-time bruise, long and narrow. Uh, she was not, he was not arrested, Lewandrowski, because of his opponents, Cruz. He was arrested. The, the determination to arrest him was made by the Jupiter, Florida Police Department. This was their investigation and their determination that he had, in all probability, committed a crime. It's no big deal, but it's a pain in the ass. Uh, now, Trump knocks women. He's always knocking women. Uh, if you recall, I wrote an article on this two weeks ago in Conk Life. He described them in a 1992 recorded inter interview. He described women as shit. S-H-I-T. No question. It's recorded. It's there. What about Megan Ryan, the, the newscaster for Fox News? Now, it's interesting that Trump and Fox News would have problems uh, because Fox News is Republican conservative. Donald Trump claims he's Republican conservative. Uh, well, you recall in the first uh, debate... Uh, he accused Meg, Megan Ryan right from the uh, right from the uh, oh Megan Kelly I'm sorry Megan Ryan Megan Kelly from the uh, right on, on on national TV that something was wrong she was having her menstrual cycle or something that was causing her to ask the kind of questions that she was now that isn't fair to him either and that's deriding women he has threatened to sue everyone who who was against him in this campaign. He constantly encourages violence. He, if somebody uh, gets up and says something against him during uh, some sort of uh, an, a, an affair he's having, a rally, etc., he says, throw them out, throw them out. And now we've seen violence occur. There's been some fights uh, with regard to the people watching and who are opposed to him. Then he has no respect for the Pope, Pope Francis. He took the Pope on, if you recall, a month ago. I don't understand how anyone takes the Pope on in any type of situation. Now he's saying he will not attend the Iowa. He will not attend an Iowa primary uh, debate that's coming up shortly, and because he just doesn't want to. Well, he says he's had enough. I don't think it's the choice of the candidate to say no more debates. I think the candidates have an obligation to put themselves out to be questioned publicly so the whole nation can see what they are about. What's happened now is Hillary Clinton's following suit. This past week she has said, I am giving, I'm not participating in any more debates with Sanders unless he changes his tone. He is now using negative ads in his campaign, and I will not debate him unless he pulls back those negative ads. Now, that's not her right to say I don't want to debate him because he's knocking me. Everybody knocks everyone else in politics. It's for you and me to decide what is truth and what is false. Uh, tonight, though, at 6 o'clock, it came over the news. She's now conceded she will participate in the debate. I don't understand. Trump has a dirty mouth. Do you like to hear him swearing? Do you like your grandchildren, your children, to hear a prospective president of the United States swear? What is this teaching your children? And what about, he gets, he gets into sex one way or another. The guy's a deviant, I think, of sorts. Remember the innuendos as to how big his uh, male organ was? That come out, too. So, I don't know, I just don't like any of this. And we're not getting to the issues, my friends. We have the economy to talk about. We have jobs to talk. We have so many important things to talk about. We are talking about garbage in the Republican uh, campaign. Staying with politics one more time, Bernie Sanders. He won big this week, this, this past week, three states. 
Washington, Hawaii, and Alaska. Sanders is on the move. Maybe, just maybe, and I, I'm a Hillary supporter, but I, I, I think she's got a lot of uh, negatives coming up. We still don't know the result of the FBI investigation. She seems to change things all the time, her positions, and then says she doesn't. She's got this problem on trustworthiness. But maybe, just maybe, Hillary does not have a lock on the nomination this year, just as they did not. She did not have a lock on the nomination in f- four years ago, rather four years ago, as against Obama. So Bernie Sanders is on the move. Let's watch this man. I'm going to stay with politics again, but no particular candidate. And this is probably the the best item, the best topic I will discuss with you tonight concerning uh, the election. We have a military-industrial complex in this country. We have Wall Street and we have big oil. Military-industrial complex, Wall Street, big oil. They are all buying. They're in a race to buy the presidency. Each one of these two groups separately is throwing billions of dollars into this campaign, hopefully. And the money's going primarily to Trump and Cruz, but Trump says he doesn't take money, so I don't know. They say they got money going. I don't know. Trump says he doesn't take money. If it ever comes out that he has, it's going to hurt him bad. But maybe it won't. Nothing seems to to bother him. He he is the Teflon man. He's like Bill Clinton. Everything slides off of him. But the money's going to Cruz also. And these aren't donations. They're smart, these people. They just don't make big money donations. Trump's staff, it is alleged, and Cruz's staff is made up of people who previously or recently worked either for the military-industrial complex, Wall Street, or Big Oil. Their men are getting in there, and in the event one of them wins, they'll be one of the close people in the White House, and that's the game that's being played there. Hawaii. Hawaii. Interesting state. Interesting thing is being done in Hawaii. Hawaii is seriously considering decriminalizing all drugs. This is a revolutionary thing. They're not saying, like most states are presently, we're going to decriminalize marijuana. They're saying all drugs, including things like cocaine and heroin. They're not defining anything. If it's a drug, we are decriminalizing it. It will be the if it goes through and it's expected to, it will be the first state that has done so. Uh, now, where does this all come from? Portugal, and I talked about this on the show a year ago. This is amazing. Portugal in 2001 did it. They decriminalized all drugs. Guess what's happened since 2001 with regard to the drug situation in Portugal? There has been a drastic reduction, yes, a drastic reduction in drug use, overdoses, and crimes. Hawaii hopes that it will be that way uh, for them, and a tremendous amount of money will be saved in the long run. California. We hear Flint, Michigan. Oh, my God, all the lead in the water, which is bad, no question. I talked on the show last week that there were six six million other people, six million at risk in the United States, schools in several states, uh, daycare centers uh, that have lead in their water. And the people know there is lead in the water. The government knows there is lead in the water, and nothing's being done. Everyone's saying, oh, my God, Flint's got a lead problem. The United States is at crisis with the lead problem. We've got to finally take the bull by the horns and take care of the situation. There is no reason, absolutely no reason, in today's society, in this year of 2016, that there should be lead in the water, lead you know, you know what lead does to children. It affects them developmentally, and they have behavioral problems because of some brain screw-ups later in life. And is this what we want? And this is what's happening because our legislators don't want to allocate the money, whether it's in the state legislature or the federal, to do what is necessary to correct the problem. It's an infrastructure situation. They've got to allocate the money, or or this is what happens. Nobody's talking about the rest of the country, though. A little thing will come up, we got lead in California. That's not enough. I haven't heard anyone big acknowledge it is a national problem, a national crisis. California has the problem because of a company that produces a battery, the Exide, E-X-I-D-E company, the Exide battery site, is in Vernon, California. Children living there 
had been affected already by the lead, uh, which, because lead is part of the composition uh, or what's put into or used in the uh, production and manufacture of a battery. Sexual atrocities committed by police officers. Sexual, you know, cops are human beings. They're bad human beings sometimes. They are committing sexual atrocities, especially with children, all over the United States. The situation is now rampant. A recent study said that the rates of sexual assault and battery, the rates of sexual assault and battery by police officers is twice as much, listen, twice as much as that committed by the average citizen. So it's got to be big. Let me give you quickly some examples. There's a Courtney Schlinke, an Ohio police officer. Uh, he's been charged with dozens of rapes and sodomy charges at, with children. A Sergeant Martin Zolga, these, all these people, by the way, have been to play guilty or been convicted. Uh, junior, an 18-year veteran, Albany County Sheriff's Department. Uh, he was working as a school resource officer with another deputy. Zolga was sending sexually explicit messages over the Internet to female students at the high school. Jacksonville uh, Sheriff's Deputy Clarence Thomas was also a high school football coach. He was having sex with the students. Cody Smith was uh, was a deputy cash C-A-C-H-E's, County Sheriff's Department member. He was forcing children to have sex with him. This one's a beauty. They won't even, the cops in this, era, in this particular department won't even identify the police officer. But there's a woman by the name of Chernicia Corley. Chernicia Corley. She was stopped. The police thought that she and some others uh, had weed in their possession. They, the police officers smelled weed, marijuana. So they were looking in the car, et cetera. Where's the weed? And you know what they did to this girl? One of the police officers put his finger up her vagina in a public parking lot if, to see if the weed was up her vaginal area. And uh, then there's the Dallas police officer, Oscar Arcesia. He raped a sleeping woman. Can you imagine? He raped a sleeping woman. And on and on it goes. We got a problem. We got a militarized police department. We got them shooting everybody up. Now we got them sexually assaulting uh, women and children especially. The, uh, the legal system in our country sometimes comes up with a strange result. James Myers, North Carolina man, 37 years old. This is Concord, North Carolina. He was driving his daughter to school. He was stopped for a bad brake light. The police officer ran him through the computer and said, gee, Mr. Myers, treat the guy with respect. We've got a problem. You have an outstanding arrest warrant, 14 years old, 14 years old, for not returning a movie to a video store in 2002, for not returning a movie to a video store in 2002. And guess what? The video store is now out of business, but nevertheless, James Myers was taken to jail. He was arrested because of that outstanding warrant. He'll never be convicted. Probably the owner of the store is gone, but this is bullshit. So, common sense has to prevail. The police officer did the right thing. He was bound to make the arrest, but these things are stupid. I don't understand. Okay, that's the show for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. I apologize for too much politics, but... Right now, this week, it seemed to be the thing that should be discussed. Again, I've tried to avoid it in recent weeks. Uh, come back again next week. Uh, I enjoy doing the show. I enjoy uh, sharing my thoughts with you. I tremendously enjoy the comments that come back to me as a result of this show. Some of you agree with me. Some of you disagree with me. Whatever it is, it's good. Uh, this show is archived, as you know, many of you are listening to it, not tonight at 9 o'clock, Tuesday night, but in the archive portion of Block Talk Radio, YouTube, and it's also linked to my Key West Lou website. Thank you again for joining me. I look forward to being with you next week. <laughs>